we shall uh, continue discussing the chapter on intergranular corrosion of uh, of uh, metals and alloys. In the previous class, I have highlighted the the importance of understanding the intergranular corrosion of uh, metals and alloys, because when you use polycrystalline material, the grain boundaries uh, they become uh, very uh, you know active because of high energy areas and also um, these uh, high energy grain boundary areas also attract the chemical species to lower the energy. For both these reasons, the grain boundaries are selectively attacked. When the grain boundaries are selectively attacked, the strength of the material becomes very low leading to loss in um, load bearing capabilities. If you have a higher stress applied on the structure, this intergranular corrosion can also lead to intergranular stress corrosion cracking. And uh, we drew the reference to uh, stainless steel. Uh, because the stainless steels are very widely used and especially when you weld the stainless steels, uh, the weldment and especially at the heat temperature zone uh, becomes uh, prone to uh, intergranular uh, cracking, intergranular corrosion we call uh, famously as uh, weld decay. So, before I also went into discussing the uh, the, uh, the sensitization or the role of uh, heating on on the intergranular corrosion, we looked at the, the, the classification of uh, various types of uh, the stainless steels. And uh, then we went on to say that the normal or conventional 304 stainless steels, uh, they have a carbon content much higher than the, the thermodynamically allowed solubility limit. So, uh, uh, and so when you, are, when you are going to do the uh, heating, then what happens? Uh, it, it leads to uh, it leads to the precipitation of this carbon. So, uh, we need to understand the, the mechanism of the intergranular corrosion in, in stainless steels. Before I do that, I, I thought I will just introduce a book which I should have done it in the yesterday. I introduce this book to you. This is you know worthwhile to to go through this book. Uh, this is a very detailed book on intergranular corrosion of steels and alloys. The author is by um, V. Chihal. and the title. the granular corrosion of uh, of steels and alloys um, materials science monographs eighteen El Savior publication. New York, it is a seasonably old book 1984. And um, I also have written a chapter uh, on localized corrosion where I have in reasonable detail discussed um, 
the intragranular corrosion of stainless steels and also some reference to aluminum alloys. If you want you can refer this as well. mechanisms and mitigation and monitoring. This book is uh, edited by uh, UK Mudali and Baldev Raj. And uh, it's published by Narosa Narosa Publishing House. New Delhi, um, two thousand eight. The pages one to forty nine. Actually, in this book. Uh, you will also have a detailed discussion about the other localized forms of corrosion that includes pitting, crevice corrosion, selective leaching, etcetera. Actually, so you can you can refer to that as well. Let us now discuss about the mechanism. of IGC of stainless steels. Please notice that the, the mechanism of, of IGC of stainless steels is not same as the, me the, the mechanism of intragranular corrosion of other kinds of alloys actually. So, you cannot just generalize this mechanism everywhere and uh, we will see that uh, as an example for aluminum alloys. Now, we have, we have seen that let us say a typical let us say uh, 304 stainless steel and we have seen that it has got iron um, 18 percent uh, chromium, 8 percent nickel and about 0 0.08 carbon content ok. And uh, the carbon is super saturated, they are in the solution uh, anneal conditions we can also call mill anneal condition raise the temperature of the uh, stainless steel sheet or plate to about 1050 degree Celsius where the carbon is highly soluble at that temperature. Then quench it rapidly so that uh, the carbon is retained in the solid solution. Now, if you heat this uh, stainless steel in the range of let us say at about 450 to 850 degrees Celsius ok and allow sufficient time ok. Then what happens is in the stainless steel you have say in this case you have iron, chromium and nickel and there is carbon. 
please notice I put carbon within the bracket because it is small quantity and in fact, it is in the solid solution it is mostly in the interstitial positions. This one is there now what happens when you heat it in the range in when you heat it in the range of uh, 450 to 850 degrees Celsius ok what happens is you will have iron nickel reminds here you have C6 forms here. So, the carbon combines preferentially with chromium and forms chromium nitride I am sorry chromium carbide ok. And why does the um, chromium carbide form over let us say iron carbide or nickel carbide if the affinity is more it is given in terms of the, the free energy change. So, the, the chemical potential of this is, is uh, very negative ok. So, the free energy change for that is so negative and so it forms preferentially uh, as uh, chromium uh, carbides. And when this forms obviously, the matrix is depleted of chromium. Not only this, there is one more important factor here that is Cr 23 C 6 formation. You can also have other kind of carbides, you can be M 7 C carbides can happen you know those kind of carbides can happen or M 4 C can happen. There are other kinds of carbides can also form. So, these these carbides they nucleate heterogeneously and they nucleate heterogeneously because you know the nucleation is the most difficult in the phase transformation and they nucleate along the grain boundaries. why the grain boundary gives additional energy to overcome the nucleation barrier right energy barrier for nucleation. So, what it means suppose I draw as a grain here and the chromic carbides are formed over here. preferentially right. So, that means, the chromium has to migrate. So, as the carbon to form the chromium carbide at the grain boundary. If you look at the diffusivity of of um, chromium and carbon right, will they be similar or different yeah different. So, which will be having a faster diffusivity the carbon because of the smaller size carbon diffuses at the fast rate whereas, the chromium diffuses at a lower rate. So, what is the consequence of that what is the consequence of that the consequence of that is what is the consequence of that? So, that means, the the diffusivity of chromium is much smaller than the diffusivity of carbon.
please notice the chemical formula right what is the chemical formula of the carbide it is 23 chromium and 4 carbon that means approximately 1 carbon takes away 4 chromium that means that means uh, you need to supply more chromium in order to form carbide chromium carbide but the diffusivity of chromium is lower compared to the, the diffusivity of the carbon. So, what is the consequence then? The consequence of that is if I draw the grain boundary, ok. If I draw the chromium content, this is the carbide here. See the chromium content will drop significantly here. Of course, it is not a correct uh, way of writing this here, it should be in fact it goes high here. Hmm? So, you find that uh, see look at the, the, the chromium carbon has got higher chromium right. And so, there is a huge depletion of chromium along the boundaries because of the fact that the diffusivity of chromium is lower compared to the diffusivity of the carbon here. And the carbon content can go below the required level for a stainless steel. What is the required level for a stainless steel? We talked about yesterday, it is about 11 percent something like that 10.8 something ok. So, if it if the carbon if the, if the chromium content goes below the, the required level for making it a stainless steel, then what happens to passivity? The passivity is lost. So, that is that is the real problem. Now, people have examined it, we in fact also examined this in our lab. Of course, uh, here please notice it is not a 304, it is a 304 L actually ok. The 304 L has got low carbon, we will talk about the story little later ok. But look at this. Even when the carbon content is very low and you heat it in the range of 675 degrees Celsius for 24 hours long time, this is the transmission electron microscope uh, image and you see the carbon uh, chromium carbide formation and in, in the grain boundary area, this is the grain boundary area I hope you are seeing this right. And he has mapped the chromium content next adjacent to the to the chromium carbide here and around the chromium carbide. The one what is referred here see here ok corresponds to this. See that the chromium level see you know at this uh, you know at this magnification uh, you know there is uncertainty in the composition right you know what is the chromium content here is supposed to be 18 percent, but what you report here is about 24 percent. So, there are limitation in the experimentation inherently that you, so do not worry about the absolute values here, but what you could see is that over here the, the 0 represent the grain boundary right. The grain boundary the chromium content falls very sharply so, about 10 you know 10 percent right just do not worry about the absolute values, but look at the difference 24 close to that close about 13. So, about 10 10 about 10 percent reduction in the chromium content occurs the grain boundary uh, because of the chromium depletion taking place you see this here ok. So, there is a problem of the chromium depletion around these area.
You also done a scan here along the uh, uh, across the, the 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 grain boundary where you have a chromium carbide precipitate. Now you see here the, the chromium carbide as higher chromium content. It's understandable, right? So there is more 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 um, uh, more chromium here because of the chromium carbide formation. The point I am trying to convey here is that when you have chromium carbide formation, the depletion of chromium occurs close to the grain boundary area and it can go to so low a level that the alloy may not be able to pass away. It. So, loses is um, is stainless steel characteristics completely. So, the chromium is is in now what happens suppose I draw this schematically here. This is the, the grain boundary here. See chromium percentage, this is the grain boundary, it moves like this here, ok. You know very well the corrosion that depends upon the chromium content, what will happen? So, you are going to have somewhere in this region, what happens? There is going to be severe attack of the grain boundaries. Uh, I show you some pictures uh, yesterday, right, where the sensitization has led to deep grain boundary attack. So, the width of this attack what you see here depends upon the extent of depletion that occurs. If the depletion is narrow, what happens? This attack becomes narrow. The depletion is, is broader, the attack becomes wider actually you can see that ok. So, essentially it is a chromium depletion that leads to the sensitization of the grain boundaries. So, this theory is called as chromium depletion mechanism. So, the mechanism is fairly simple, it is not very complicated right. Now, we need to understand what are the governing factors for intergranular corrosion? There is a cause and there is a effect here right. What is the cause? The cause is subjecting to some heat treatment leading to chromium carbide formation. The effect is corrosion along the grain boundaries that is what. So, the primary reason is the chromium carbide formation along the grain boundaries. So, now can we quantify, can we understand the intergranular corrosion in more details ok. Um, as I told you it is the temperature and the time both are important. Before I go in details uh, how many of you are from the non metallurgy background? Oh, quite a few of them. I have heard of uh, the time temperature transmission diagrams in a few, so called the TTT diagrams ok. So, let me just uh, briefly cover this aspect of this ok and so that you get a real feel of that. Let me tell you how you get uh, the TTT diagram for sensitization. Suppose you take a stainless steel, let us say let us take type 304 stainless steel. 
I want to establish time temperature transformation diagrams, they call as T T T diagrams. In this case, I call as time temperature IGC diagrams. How do you establish this diagram? Okay. What one does is um, 304 stainless steel is taken, uh, maybe say P, let us say about take some long strip of that ok, take long strip of uh, 304S stainless steel subject them to uh, heat treatment for different temperatures let us say T 1, T 2, T 3, T 4 something like that. This is the temperature for different time intervals. Say T 1, T 2, T 3, T 4, etcetera, keep doing that actually, ok. So, you can take this material and subject them to heat treatment uh, in the approximate temperature region. Let us say one can start with. Let us say maybe you start with let us say about 850 degrees Celsius, maybe down to let us to about let us say about 400 degrees Celsius, something like that. Different temperature intervals and time intervals do the heat treatment on that. Then you subject them to the intragranular corrosion. to intergranular corrosion. Uh, there are various solutions available ok. Maybe you can take a hydrochloric acid HCl you can take maybe, some, maybe you know 10 percent HCl you can take and ok and you can you can boil that expose the sample. You take the sample out in this case and you can bend the sample over a mantle right, you can bend it over a mantle. Okay. When you bend it over a mantle what will happen now? There is a tensile stress here. So, what will happen now? When the grain boundaries are attacked very selectively, the grain boundaries will open up. This is the grain boundary right and you can measure the depth of attack. And the depth of attack is a uh, is related to the intragranular corrosion right. If there is if the grain boundaries uh, are sensitized more and more chromium carbides are formed, more chromium depletion has occurred then what happens then the grain boundaries uh, become susceptible to, to corrosion. Now, you can have the depth of attack and you have you have done a, a big matrix of you have done a big matrix of test right various 
temperatures and time. All these cases, what you can do is you can you can plot depth of attack versus the time. You can do it for different temperatures. Now, you will notice that So, you can have several um, temperatures and uh, in this case what happened T 1 is greater than T 2 is greater than T 3 greater than T 4. What do you notice from here? There is time for initiation for intragranular corrosion right. So, you can find out this and you can plot you can plot the um, temperature versus the time for start of IGC, this is for the start of IGC right. So, what happens goes like that as the temperature is decreased what happens to the time for initiation of uh, IGC increases right start increasing like that. Now, if you raise the temperature, you will also get like this. It is very interesting now, ok. You see, when you raise the temperature also again, the time for initiation of IGC increases, right. This is a little a metallurgical uh, concept. I think uh, those guys who studied phase transformation do, they will understand much easier, ok. And, uh, and above this temperature, look at this, above this temperature, gamma is stable, ok. The gamma as now this is also gamma stable, gamma stable here. Here what happens? Here it is the what is this? This is the initiation of chromic carbide formation starts. Right? Am I right in this? Now you can understand that when when lower the temperature, the time taken is 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 uh, is, is increasing. But again, you raise the temperature, again the time taken is increasing here, right? What is the reason for that? Those who have studied metallurgy you should be able to tell this. Yeah. Yeah, ok. You can also say that under cooling, um, ok. Um, well, under cooling again, the, you guys should know what under cooling means, right? Free energy of free energy. Yeah. So, the free energy change, the free energy change for that is is actually is increasing is increasing like this ok is increasing right from here down to there. So, it should go one way only ok. The reason for that is is related to two factors if you can uh, recollect any of you it depends upon the nucleation 
It also depends upon the growth process. And growth process requires higher temperature because the diffusion becomes faster. The nucleation requires more under cooling or lower temperatures. So, there is a compromise between these two, right. So, you find that a high temperature diffusion is faster, but the but the nucleation becomes slower. So, you find that again the, the time for transformation is is increasing actually. So, it goes this is a typical uh, we call as T T T diagram time temperature tra the transformation diagram. What is transforming here? The gamma is transforming into this one of course, plus the gamma here. Please notice if you look at this diagram what is very clear here? The chromium carbide starts forming only and around these regions there will be no chromium carbide formation. How do I interpret this? At any given temperature, suppose I, I take this temperature, I take this temperature, unless you cross this line, the alloy will not get sensitized, ok. That is true for all cases. You can also plot, what you can plot? Please look at, you can also plot, this is the maximum attack, right? I can also plot a maximum attack. Maximum, right? This is IGC maximum. But again, please notice it goes from maximum again falls down here. That means you hit for longer time. What is happening to IGC? decrease. Why does it happen? Why should on prolonged annealing the IC is to drop? Growing carbon exists there, right? That does not dissolve. So, you are allowing enough time for the neutralization of the depleted zone, right? Now, the chromium earlier, the carbon was diffusing faster and chromium could not catch up with that and so, there is more depletion along the grain boundary. Right. So, with the, with the longer interval, the depleted region gets neutralized. The, the, the there will be because there is a concentration gradient, the chromium will start moving towards the depleted regions and they get neutralized. So, the IGC decreases, it decreases and decreases and so on. Please understand that. So, what does really imply? It implies that what is the implication of that in, in alloy making? What is the implication of this alloy making? I will come back to this later. What is the implication of that? What are the implications? Chromium combines with carbon and forms Cr23 C6, 23 7 carbon, 6 carbon. What is the carbon content in the alloy? It is about 0 0.08 percent, right. The carbon takes away the chromium. Can I simply increase the chromium content let us say 40 percent instead of 18 percent chromium I added to the alloy 40 percent chromium. Do you think the sensitization will, will go away? Because I am compensating with more more chromium. So,
No, it do not go because it is not that we do not have enough chromium to combine with carbon. Even you even if the if the if the all the carbon present in the stainless steel combines with chromium, the remaining chromium in the in the overall composition is still higher right. The overall composition of chromium in the alloy is still higher to call it a stainless steel. The problem here is that the chromium depleted around the grain boundary area that is what the concern that is happening because of the diffusivity difference not because of the stoichiometry difference. So, that diffusivity problem still arises and so by just increasing the chromium content of the alloy you cannot simply control the intragranal corrosion right. So, that is simply not possible right. So, it is the diffusion kinetics that are responsible for the, the chromium carbide formation on the uh, grain boundary and the consequent um, uh, chromium depletion around the grain boundaries. So, this curve essentially means that I have enough chromium in the in the material no problem and over a time period the depleted regions they uh, they become replenished and so the uh, the grain boundaries uh, become uh, resistance to the intragranular corrosion which of course this these are the things are not possible in real life situations ok. We will see later ok. Theoretically yes, but practically they are not useful at all actually. So, the factors that control IGC can be seen from this diagram. If I take say 304 stainless steel, I keep it at let us say 1050 degrees Celsius, I hold it here longer time, I quench it fast in fact I should quench it uh, faster than this. We quench it a little slower, let us say cooling rate 1, cooling rate 2 and cooling rate 3. The cooling rate 2 is what is the cooling rate? It is dt upon the cooling rate right. Now, the 1 2 is is the critical cooling rate. A cooling rate higher than the 2 will avoid sensitization, the cooling rate lower than this will lead to sensitization of the stainless steels. So, this diagram sets a limit for various thermal processes that can lead to either sensitization or that can avoid sensitization right. So, the temperature the time both are important. So, when I said that it is between 450 and 850 please understand that ok. If it is not 450 just like that somebody asks a question to you oh can we not be 430 what would be your answer? Will, will you sensitize at 430? Yes, it could. 860 cannot be? Yeah, possible because it is a time and temperature are equally important. So, these numbers are indicative and that also depends upon the alloy, it is not going to be same for all kind of alloys. We will see later actually why it is ok. okay. So, that means you need to understand 
what are the things that govern the time temperature transformation diagrams. So, you understood this anybody has any question here. This diagram is very relevant because we are going to talk about well decay and how do you avoid well decay or how to make new alloys all of them are based on this diagram. And so, you need to understand this one more uh, clearly. So, there will be no uh, doubt as far as this diagram is concerned. See, a typical 304 stainless steel right, we discussed earlier that it has about 0 0.08 weight percent carbon or in fact, in a, you know if you are going to have 18 chromium 8 nickel I can go as much as 0 0.1 weight percent carbon I can go as much of that. Because at high temperature carbon solubility in the austenitic matrix increases high temperature right. So, dissolve single phase the gamma phase. Now, if we quench it very fast then what happens? Now, or if you or you cool it very slowly what happens? Suppose, you you held it at 1050 degree Celsius and all the carbon is in the in the in the soluble state. You cool very slowly. So, what will happen now? The carbon will come out because the solubility of carbon in austenite decreases with temperature right because the room temperature solubility of carbon in this alloy is about 0 0.028 percent. So, 0 0.028 percent is what maximum the alloy can dissolve carbon at ambient temperatures. So, what will happen to excess carbon? It is like this is very similar to you know it is similar to sodium chloride you take water and and add sodium chloride it dissolves right. You keep on adding more what happens after some time? sodium chloride does not dissolve right. Rise the temperature what happens to sodium chloride dissolves I cool it down again it start crystallizing from that right. So, it is a phase rule nothing different from that you know in this case when carbon is forced to dissolve at the high temperature when you cool it down thermodynamically it is going to form another phase because it is not soluble. Now, the how does the uh, carbon come out? carbon does not come out as carbon it comes out as chromium carbide precipitate because of this is this gives you the free energy change for that is going to be very negative ok. So, that what happens here now if you cool it very fast then what happen you do not allow the carbon to diffuse it is frozen right. And so, at, at room temperature you may have even 0 0.1 weight per, 0 0.158 percent carbon or 0 0.08 weight percent carbon all of them in the solid state and the frozen no precipitates. But you when you heat it again what happens you are giving energy for the carbon atom to move right and the move around what happens it forms chromium carbide because of the phase rule that dictates. So, in 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 304 stainless steel when you are the so called mill annealed stainless steels what they have done they have held this stainless steel sheets or plates whatever at that temperature 1050 dissolve all the carbon you quench it rapidly and so what you get is a is a nice 304 you can pass away no chromium carbides. Now, if you are talking about industry guy what rate you should quench it that is given by this diagram right. This diagram tells that this is the lowest cooling rate that is tolerable. If you are going to lower the cooling rate you know below this then what happens then 
you are going to have chromium carbide precipitations. So, that dictates what should be the cooling rate that can that can avoid the sensitization of uh, 3 or 4 stainless steels. So, this is a an important thing that we should be understanding ok. So, so let us take this further and see how this the factors controlling sensitization. What is the factor? The first and foremost is the carbon content. If you have higher carbon content, what will happen to kinetics? We will have it will be faster, right? One. 2 I use a very crude term carbon getter if you can remove the carbon activity in the alloy what happens it decreases the kinetics carbon getter or which can change the activity of carbon in the alloy. This are changing the activity of carbon. You can also control this by controlling the nucleation. And growth. You can control the nucleation of chromium carbide formation, that can control the sensitization process. So, broadly, these are the three ways you can control the sensitization of stainless steels. Let me take the effect of carbon. It is not a rocket science, right? If we increase the carbon content you will see the kinetics will increase. Let us take a stainless steel uh, let us say 3 or 4 ok. It has got let us say 0 0.08 the carbon content the 0 0.05 0 0.03 and 0 0.02. Eight percent carbon. If I have to draw a TTT diagram for this, so I am drawing for let us say uh, three zero four, I am drawing. like this ok. It is about I am keeping here about let us say 400 degree Celsius maybe around about 850 you know. So, what will happen to 0 0.05, 0 0.03, 0 0.02 or you can even have 0 0.01 for example, it moves to the right that is fantastic right.
please look at even these like these also coming down why because solubility of you know because it is just dissolved you know there is no much carbon. So, it dissolves at low temperatures completely ok. So, you find that this moves towards the right side. The whole lot of stainless steels to avoid sensitization were developed based on this concept right 0 0.08, 0 0.03. This is this this is called as 304 L. This is called as this is called 304 extra low carbon, ok. XL extra low carbon. The nuclear industries even 0 0.03 is not allowed, not tolerated, ok. People go for 0 0.0 or 0 0.015 something like that people go for that. So, the development of low carbon stainless steels have a basis, the basis is what the time temperature sensitization diagram for that actually. There is a problem in removing carbon, what is the problem? And of course, making is is expensive ok and what is the other one? The strength goes up. So, ok. So, low carbon stainless steels are a expensive have lower strength. So, somebody is making a pressure vessel automatically the cost goes up on both accounts ok. One related to the expense and other one related to the strength levels. So, can we retain the carbon and then prevent sensitization right. So, what we will talk about is the second concept adding the getters. What are they? Titanium, niobium, tantalum. The titanium added one, the stainless steel is called as 3 4 7, excuse me, 3 2 1 and this is called as 3, 4, 7 stainless steel. So, two uh, types of stainless steels have emerged, these are called as stabilized grade stainless steels. What are the principle here? The principle is very similar to the sensitization. If you take a 304 chromium carbide forms in preference to the iron carbide in preference to the nickel carbide, but you add a third element another element which is forms much stronger carbide then automatically carbon will go to other element. So, the titanium forms titanium carbide. So, as niobium carbide and tantalum carbides. So, you allow the carbon in the material to interact with them and form these carbides. So, what happens to the activity of carbon in the system? The activity of carbon in the system falls very low and so the sensitization becomes extremely slow ok. So, if you can if you can plot this 3 or 4 is your 
3 of 4 L and this is going to be your 3 to 1 and 3 4 7. In fact, 3 to 1 and 3 4 7 are much more resistance to uh, sensitization than 3 or 4 L actually, but the carbon content uh, the carbon activity uh, of the stainless steel drops very low because of the association of titanium carbide, iodine carbide and tantalum carbide into this and they are called as the stabilized grade stainless steels. Okay. Now, there is something which is little not straightforward, little indirect ok that we need to understand uh, because you will see that some alloys unexpectedly cause sensitization even though the carbon content of this stainless are similar right. Those who studied metallurgy the it will be easier, but some of other people also can try to understand actually. The activity of an alloying element in an alloy does not depend upon its own concentration, it also depends upon the other elements present in the alloy. For example, carbon activity may depend upon chromium content, it may depend upon the manganese content nitrogen content and so on and so forth. And so, when you talk about sensitization, it is just not you count only the carbon content in the alloy, you have to look at the effective activity of carbon. So, that it does not get sensitized. So, the work has been done actually you know the R K Dayal from I G Kar Kalpakam had done some nice work, I just make it very brief here. The carbon activity is given in terms of what is called as chromium effective chromium content. Please notice when you add more chromium content, the activity of carbon comes down. So, the use of term which is called as chromium effective, which is given as chromium plus 1.45 moly minus 0 0.19 nickel minus 100 carbon ok plus 0 0.13 manganese minus 0 0.22 silicon minus 0 0.5 aluminum minus 0 0.2 0 cobalt plus 0 0.01 copper plus 0 0.61 titanium plus 0 0.34 vanadium minus 0 0.22 tungsten plus 9.2 nitrogen. It is very difficult for you to remember all of them, but I want you to appreciate this ok. There are certain elements they will favor sensitization, there are certain elements which retard sensitization that is what I want to make the point here right. What are the elements that favor um, sensitization are the ones where you see with the, with the minus sign here say nickel obviously carbon right, silicon, aluminum, cobalt and tungsten. So, you may have a same carbon content in the alloy, but by chance nickel content is more. Now, what happens? The alloy with higher nickel content will sensitize, the alloy with lower nickel content may not sensitize when you are in the borderline case ok. Similarly, 
if you are going to add let us say manganese in the system, molybdenum, let us say nitrogen, they will suppress sensitization of the alloy here. Where does this problem come? It comes in practice also, ok. Especially uh, you know the, the nuclear industries assume that somebody has got 304 L or extra low carbon. Assume that you have 18 chromium, you have let us say 8 nickel and 0 0.02 carbon. If the alloy is not controlled, it goes for 18 chromium, 10 nickel, 0 0.02 carbon, ok. What happens? This may sensitize you may think that the carbon content is similar, why not? No. Sorry, problem not 18, 10 nickel, nobody adds uh, 18 nickel, put 10 nickel, ok. So, uh, if there is a 10 nickel by mistake is added or you feel very happy because nickel is expensive, ok. But this might sensitize and this guy may not sensitize actually or assume that other way around 0.05 carbon, 0.05 carbon. This border line, this guy does not sensitize here for sure it is going to sensitize. So, uh, you know going into more details about sensitization, it is also important to understand what are the associated chemistry of the, the alloying elements uh, that will affect the um, uh, uh, intergranular corrosion when you give a heat treatment at all. See, please notice that you know if it is all solutionized nicely and they do not have any problem, right. But when you sensitize it, I think some of them may be having uh, some alloys may, may, may have a faster kinetics, but some of them may not have uh, sensitized at all actually. Hmm. Um, one more thing that I just want to uh, discuss and then we close for today's discussion, ok. That is about the nucleation alloy, ok. We know about the grain boundaries. We call them as two types high angle grain boundary or a low angle grain boundary. is also called as special boundaries sometimes. They call special boundaries, sigma boundaries, they call it in metallurgical terms. What is the difference between a high angle grain boundary and, and a low angle grain boundary? Anybody here have exposure to this? In the high angle grain boundary, look at the high angle grain boundary. Look at the energy from the point of view. See, you have an interface, right? Ok. High angle grain boundary. as high energy and low angle grain boundary as as low energy. Now, the nucleation occurs heterogeneous nucleation right, nucleation occurs at the grain boundary because 
energy of the grain boundary is higher compared to within um, the grain actually right it gives interface. Now, what happens now that means, if you look at the nucleation. So, what happens the nucleation I call this 1 called 2 is is um, is is um, is easier in 1 in, in, in 1 than in in 2. So, if you are going to now make the alloy with a low angle grain boundary, then the alloy will not undergo will undergo sensitization, but will undergo sensitization at a much lower kinetics ok. So, the the low angle grain boundary is also called as twin boundaries right ok. Even twin boundaries called low angle grain boundaries. So, if I have to plot time actually these are log huh? actually unfortunately I have not made there properly ok. Time is always log here unfortunately please correct your earlier slides ok. Normal grains Called say twin boundaries. So sensitization. So you can also change the change the grains so that you can uh, you can control the sensitization of of the alloy actually. Well, I think we will continue I, I think it is not over yet uh, uh, we, we can talk about it um, uh, more in the next class ok. And uh, for the time being we will end our discussion uh, related to the uh, the grain boundary uh, natures.